friends, Heidi here from Rain Country, God is good, all the time. And I'm here for another this and that video, so let's get to it and I'll show you all the goodies I got out here and what I'm going to be doing today and within the next couple of days as well. And so I want to start off by talking about this mango butter I just recently bought. Now I had one of my subscribers that was talking about trying out some mango butter and I had been looking at it for a while and considered it and just thought, eh, I'll just wait because I know the shea butter's working really great. But I finally broke down and bought some. And um, right out of the package, I really like the feel of this much better than the shea butter as far as to use straight. And also because the scent of it is very, very mild, unlike the stronger scent of the shea butter, which I personally don't care for the scent of shea butter. It's just that's just me. I don't know why, but some people seem to like it. It's just not my favorite thing. But this one is very mild, and it is made from the seed of the mango, uh, just in case you're curious. And it's very rich, and it has a lot of the same wonderful properties that shea butter has, other, you know, except that it's just a little smoother. It's a little easier to use straight out of the package. Now, the drawbacks to the mango butter, and here's the thing, I was thinking about making, I needed to make another batch of my most popular skin cream with the frankincense and grapefruit and and uh, ylang ylang in it to put up on the store, and I was thinking about trying the mango butter in replace of the shea butter in, in that, and I was kind of debating, it's like, well, I don't really want to change my recipe and the fact on that one just because people like that one so much and it's such a good seller. In looking into the, uh, to the mango butter, before I, I decided to jump in and make the skin cream that I was going to put up on my store out of the mango butter, one of the drawbacks that I came across is that the shelf life is about one third to one quarter of what your shea butter is. So I really didn't want to make the skin cream since I make it in batches. I don't make large batches. I usually only fill six tins at a time. But I also, just in case, it, sometimes things, they sell out quickly and sometimes they take a little bit longer. And I just didn't really want to risk making it out of something that has a, a short shelf life that is about three to four months, whereas shea butter is at least a year. Now, because of the shorter shelf life, I'm actually keeping this in the freezer because it's going to take me a long time to work through this. Now, I did try making a small batch of skin cream just for myself, and though I really like the feel of it, one thing I realized today, and my eyes are still feeling a little bit weird, is that I used it just the same way I use my regular skin cream on you know right I rub it all over my face I don't care about it getting on my eyes or anything well my eyes have been bothering me that same feeling I get whenever I use you know certain types of oils like back years ago I used to use mineral oil to reuse to remove my eye makeup and then it always bothered my eyes you know baby oil has got mineral oil in it same thing you shouldn't use that around your eyes that's the same feeling I got from this now I don't know uh, I don't have that problem with the one I use with the shea butter. I can't be certain whether or not it is a result of the mango butter or if it's simply because I made the skin cream a little bit different, I didn't measure anything out, and I completely left out the beeswax because I was trying to do mostly the base of the mango butter, and so I just used a little bit of my my uh, infused oil for my, you know, my herbal infused oil, the same stuff I use in my skin cream, and no beeswax and then I did still put in the essential oils I don't know it, if it's just because I left out the beeswax because I the recipe was a little bit different or if it's the mango butter but I'm going to go ahead and put that out there as a cautionary statement that you may not want to try using this around your eyes now I might try it again just straight and then rub it all over my face like I normally would my skin cream and see if I have that same issue with my eyes, with it bothering them. Then I'd know for certain whether or not it's coming from this. And then I can update you on that if you still, later, if you still haven't tried the mango butter. But I still recommend this. I think it's really great, but I think it's gonna be something if you choose to make skin cream out of it, only make small batches at a time, uh, you know, a batch that you're gonna use up within three to four months so you don't have to worry so much about the shelf life. Now I know my other skin cream, I've had it for at least a year, been using the same stuff for at least a year, a batch I made a long time ago, and it hasn't gone bad. It's still great. It doesn't bother my eyes or my skin or anything. So 
Um, I know my my original recipe is works really good. Now I'll go ahead and link to my original recipe if you're wanting to know how to make your own skin cream right up here and in the description box down below. Okay, the next item I wanted to talk about was this. You can see here, um, you might recognize that lady on there. That is Mary over at Mary's Nest. So if you were following the whole carousel package thing that we did and we, we sent the package out with a bunch of goodies that we had made, homemade stuff, you know, Patrick's wood products, skin cream, soap, all kinds of stuff, seeds and so on. And then we sent it to several homes around the United States and one of those places was Mary's Nest. And when it came back to us, it had in there a package of her own homegrown and home dried herbal blend of Ital her Italian herb blend. And um, I grow all these same herbs. However, it was really nice just to have it all in a blend all ready to go. And so I've been using it. I tried it in my homemade breakfast sausage and a few other things and, and some sauce. And I wanna thank Mary again for this wonderful blend that she included in there and for being a part of the Homestead Carousel package. That was really fun. And anyway, Mary, this was a great blend. If you haven't checked out Mary's Nest, uh, I know I talk about her a lot, but she's such a great lady. She was following me on YouTube for quite a while before she started her own channel and was very generous, sent me some lots of wonderful gifts. And uh, anyway, go check out her channel. I will link to it down below so you can you can find that easy enough if you haven't found her already. She does really, ex she has excellent quality to her videos and has a lot to teach people. Okay, and then the other thing I wanna talk about, so keep in mind, um, since I'm like two to three weeks ahead of my videos right now, I did actually lose a little bit of time because I took some time off, you know, during the wedding week and all that. But anyway, I wanna let you know that today that I'm actually shooting this video is August 26th. So we're not into September yet as the time that I'm shooting this. So I'm still harvesting some blackberries out of our garden and we're getting some really good size ones. In fact, these are just kind of the standard size blackberries that we get off this particular variety look at that one there um, and it is I don't know the actual name of it I don't if it was on there I don't recall but the plant was given to me years ago by my brother-in-law what I do know is it is a thornless and we, it's the one we have planted between our deck over here and our greenhouse and to, this year has been putting out the most blackberries that it's ever put out. And they're quite tasty. And what I've been doing, and you can see in here, this little bit of green, this is uh, some stevia from the garden. Working my way back off of the whole detox thing, so I've been working my way back into eating meats again and dairy, though I'm still keeping that stuff kind of, especially the dairy and the grains, I'm really trying to keep that to a minimum and just have like the grains maybe like you know my homemade bread or whatever maybe just once twice a week and then uh and same thing with the sugars and the dairy just uh, really trying to keep uh just a tight rein on that for now and so anyway what i've been doing with this is i've been taking the blackberries and blending them with my zucchini because i still have a lot of zucchini which by the way this is that one i showed in a garden update and i wanted you to see me holding it this thing is uh, what did I say? It's eight pounds, nine and a half ounces. It's the biggest one I have I've had so far to get it. I don't typically like to let them get this big. I should have just went ahead and left it because I have yet to save zucchini seed because I'm always afraid about cross pollination. But because of where I grow the zucchini, I'm not really concerned about it cross pollinating with the other squash. So I think I should go ahead and try saving some seed this year and then just try a couple of those but uh, I just don't want to end up with a mutt, zoo, mutt squash. Sometimes they're not very good and they, they can just be really tough. But sometimes you can end up with a pretty tasty squash with a cross, having it crossed. But anyway, what I've been doing is taking the blackberries and some of my zucchini and then mixing it in the blender and adding a little bit of half and half, just enough to give it enough liquid so that it will blend easily, but also not make it watery. But the, you know, the half and half will also help make it a little bit richer without it being too much dairy. So that's why, you know, trying to rely on the zucchini part of it to give it more of that richness. And then um, the last batch I made, I added some coconut sugar and then the blackberries. And then I stick it in the freezer and let it partially freeze, you know, stirring it periodically. So it's kind of the consistency of a real thick milkshake. And it's been a very tasty treat. So adding the stevia and some coconut sugar, you know, I'm still getting a little bit of the sugar, but I'm getting some good organic 
coconut sugar with the high mineral content and then make it up some of that excess sweetness with the homegrown stevia and it's you know it's been turning out really good so i you know i can kind of satisfy that sweet tooth a little bit and also still using up my zucchini and just the garden produce in general so just something you might want to try and just be creative when you're looking for something like that. You're looking for either low cal, low sugar, whatever it is, or just a way to use up some of that garden produce, which by the time you see this video, I'm going to guess that your zucchinis are probably all done, but you may still have some sitting around waiting to be used up. Or maybe even in the freezer, if you've ch chunked up your zucchini and stuck it in the freezer, I would say that would work really good. And you probably wouldn't need to add any liquid to it anyway, because it should blend up really good if it's already been frozen without adding any half and half or water or anything to it. So if you want to try it completely vegan, dairy free, that would be one way to do it. Okay, and then another thing, and I thought of this because my eyes were bothering me so much with the, you know, from the oil, the from putting that skin cream on my face, that uh, one of the things I use for my eyes is my own homemade eye drops, which are simply nothing but my homemade colloidal silver with a little bit of just a pinch in this, in a bottle like this, just a little pinch of salt in there. And that would be, I still use the mineral salt, you know, either the Redmond Real or the Himalayan salt and then you shake it up really good and the salt what that does is it helps it to match your own body chemistry because you need just a little bit of salt in there obviously not too much and then um, I use this as an eye wash uh, so I've been you know using this to help rinse that stuff out of my eyes so they'd feel better and it's, it works really good the main reason I wanted to talk about this with that reminder is that uh, about a month ago tops I had I got this sudden eye infection that really made me think of conjunctivitis because my eyes were burning and they were turning red and it seems like sometimes that stuff can come on really quickly and I haven't had conjunctivitis since I think I was a teenager maybe or maybe in my or in my 20s when I was teaching dance I might have picked it up from a student I don't remember it's been so long but I was pretty sure that's what it was because I kept getting those that gunk buildup within just a few minutes. So I'm like, this has got to be conjunctivitis because it had that same burning, itchy feeling and the and the redness and then the gunk. And so I immediately went to work using my colloidal silver eye drops and I kept putting these in and kept putting these in throughout the day, rinsing my eyes out. And by the evening, my eyes were all better. And uh, so a really great way to cure eye infections is using the colloidal silver as your eye drops just don't forget to add that little pinch of salt in there I did the same thing with my old dog Angel that we used to have she was a full bred Chihuahua she had a little bit of the buggy eyes and as she got older she it got harder for her to see and at that time my grapevine plants were really young and she'd go sniffing around in there and she would scratch her eyes on the the branches of the grapevines because she wouldn't see them and then she would then they would get infected and uh, what one of the best things I did was using the colloidal silver drops in her eyes straight in there and I don't dilute the colloidal silver now if you make your homemade colloidal silver like we do it ends up a real dark color when you're done consider diluting it a little bit I don't personally I just use it straight as is but uh, anyway, we have a video out there uh, showing how to make your own colloidal silver generators and how to make the colloidal silver. I'll go ahead and link to in both places. And we also sell the pre-made colloidal silver generators, the small ones with the batteries on our Etsy store. Pat's been really trying to keep those pumped out because they've been one of our most popular items on our store. So you can check that out. It doesn't come with the silver. However, what I did finally do today is I've always just used the silver bars like you can buy, you know, like a coin but in the bar shape. You can all, actually for a better price, you can buy silver rods. You want to make sure they're like 99.9% .9 pure silver. And then uh, anyway, you can find the bars or even wire and you can use that instead and then have about a six inch piece you put in your quart size jar. So I'm going to link down below an Amazon search where you can find those because I went to look and it's like, wow, that's a better deal to do it that way. So instead of buying the, the silver bars that are usually about $20 a piece, for about $25, you can get two rods 
and or for even less you can buy some silver wire now I've never tried that but the rods I would recommend more than the wire but you can try it but I would say the rods two of them for $25 that's a better deal and uh, you've got a little more surface area to work with because it's going clear down to the bottom of the jar pretty much so I think I'm going to try that eventually but um, anyway check that out if you're interested and if you decide to buy our colloidal silver generator and you still need the silver to go with it okay so moving on from there another thing that I make myself is my own homemade muscle rub I have a recipe on this I will go ahead and link to here and down below and this is a I just had to fill this bottle up so I keep these two bottles in in different places this is the main bottle that I'll refill this one from I still have a while yet before I need to make more but since I had to refill this bottle I was just reminded of this um, Patrick I tend to use this on his lower back you know when he's working I'm doing he's actually helping somebody else with a roof now ours we still need the ridge cap and a couple other minor things but ours is pretty much done but now he's helping somebody else and all this work has kind of taken a toll on his back so I'll rub this in his back and then also the other thing was my the top of my foot my right foot I don't know if it's because I started doing jumping jacks again or if it's from all the sewing and the treadle machine but it feels like I pulled a muscle across the arch of my foot so I've been using this on my foot and it's really helped quite a bit so if you're interested in this this is also really good for a joint rub I started making it many years ago while I was still teaching dance and before I got off the thyroid medicine was having a lot of knee joint problems getting off the thyroid medicine was the best thing for getting rid of the the joint problems but anyway I was using this and it would help quite a bit and it was really great for sprains you know it comes into play quite often so check out that video if you're interested so both for joints and for muscles and it just the a lot of the essential oils and stuff that are in there and I also have my it's an infused cayenne uh, the oil is a cayenne pepper infused oil and then uh, just being able to rub that sometimes if I just not feeling good I can rub a little bit in here around my glands and it can make me feel really good I haven't needed to do that for a long time but years ago when I was having various issues during that time I was taking myself off the thyroid that was one of the things that just kind of helped me feel better I noticed it kind of gave me a little bit of energy too okay and another little tip that I already pointed out fairly recently in another video but I wanted to show it again in case you don't watch that one because I can't remember what that video was about but it might be something that I think it was the powdered sugar one you know some people are like oh I'm not gonna watch it. I already know how to make powdered sugar but uh, you might have missed my little tip that I brought up so what I have here is a peanut butter jar lid from the organic peanut butter we used to buy and these will fit on a regular mouth jar particularly the Kerr jars it fits on the Kerr it just seems to the threading seems to work better on the Kerr than it does on the ball for some reason and certain other uh, canning jars the ball is the only one I tend to have a problem with but anyway you if you buy peanut butter in this where it's this size then try your those lids and see if they fit on your regular mouth jars then what you can do is right in here what I have is a regular mouth a metal canning lid and this this is one that let's say you can uh, it's one that you've already canned something with and you don't maybe you don't want to use it again for canning I always recycle my metal lids and this is one way to use them is inside either these peanut butter jar lids it actually works better in these because once it's in there it is very hard to get it back out but it will also fit inside the white ball ones and what you can what that does then is it you've got that little rubber ring or that little gummy ring inside the lid is it actually helps you to get a tight seal on your jars such as what I have here with my homemade uh, fermentation starter that I made from the blueberries and the currants I have the same idea here see right there and so I can when a lot of times what I'll do is once I I use the fermentation starter I'll add a little bit more sugar to it and then I like to shake it up and so what that does is that keeps having that lid inside there helps keep it from leaking it's not totally foolproof but it seems to help quite a bit and it's also going to just put a tighter seal on whatever it is that you've got uh, that you want to uh, just have a tighter seal on it than having just the plastic lid on there alone so this is a good way to do it you can buy the silicone liners if you want but this is a cheaper way because you can simply take the metal lids that you already have and recycle them okay and then another thing I wanted to talk about is um, 
again, remember, this is August 26th I'm shooting this. So this is one of my purple tomatoes, uh, the biggest one I've picked so far. A real nice looking tomato. But what I've been doing with all my tomatoes, the ones that we don't eat on salad or just pick and eat right off the plant, is I've been dehydrating them up. And this jar right here is still open because I'm going to be topping it off later today with the tomatoes that I have in there. So I just process them in the blender. I just cut the tomatoes up process them in the blender, and then pour it onto my uh, food saver trays with the fruit roll-up thing. And then I just put on the dehydrator. I do set that the dehydrator at a little higher, like around 120-ish, because it, takes a, it can take a long time for it to dry, especially if you pour it on pretty thick. But anyway, and then once they're fully dry, I break it up. You can powder it if you want. I prefer to just break it up into flakes. Um, I'll put, the, put them in there, and then I'll even take my little pestle and just crush it down in there just to make it really packed down in there tight. And then this is what I use for making my Italian sauces or homemade ketchup or just for simply using to thicken my sauce because I still have a whole bunch of canned tomatoes. And you know, instead of making a tomato paste which takes a long time for it to cook down, you can simply take your dehydrated tomatoes and add it in there or make it just from this just by adding a small amount of water. But for now, since I have a whole bunch of home canned tomatoes just from previous years, I've just been taking those, taking my tomato flakes, because I have a whole bunch from last year and the year before of the tomato flakes, and just thickening my sauce up that way. And same thing when I make the ketchup, take some of the, the home canned tomatoes and just add this in until I get the thick consistency I want. Then I don't have to cook it forever to get it down to a paste or, and I don't have to buy the store-bought tomato paste, which I haven't bought tomatoes in, canned tomatoes from the store of any variety in years. Not even the organic ones because of the acid in the tomatoes and the cans. I had read years ago, who knows if it's true, I think I only read it in one spot, but I read that there can be issues with the acid of the tomatoes mixed in with the metal of the cans. And uh, so I figured, well, I'll just avoid that and just stick with my own home canned tomatoes. Um, and my own home dried tomatoes that I can use for sauce. So that's just one way to do it. I'm hoping to get a couple more jars. So I'll fill this one up today and I know I should get at least one more quart jar and that will last me for quite a while, especially with the tomatoes I already have canned up and mixing those in and then that just spreads it out even more. Okay, and then, oh, got my first egg from one of my black chickens, my black sex links, which I still haven't named yet because they all, the three of them look exactly the same, though they're starting to show their different personalities. I still can't tell by the looks of them which one is which, but so it's just a little egg. It's slightly darker than the Buff Orpington egg, but the funny thing about this is it's got some lighter spots on it. It almost reminds you of the way a good watermelon looks, because you know when you pick out a watermelon at the store, you look for the ones that have the yellow spot on it. Those are the best ones. But the weird thing is that it's a nice solid shell on it. Now, when my Buff Orpingtons were young and their first eggs that started coming in, the very first egg of each chicken was a very soft shell. In fact, there was one that just didn't even have a shell at all, it seemed like, it was just the membrane. And that's really, that's normal for when they first start laying. But so I was surprised that I actually got a real egg with a nice hard shell on it but it's just kind of small. Now, I don't know, maybe their eggs are smaller because they're a smaller chicken, but we'll see as they go along. Okay, one more thing I need to talk about is I'm going to be making some shampoo either today or tomorrow. Um, I'm down to my last little bit, so I filled, this is the, the bottle that I keep in the shower and, uh, and wash my hair with. I'm not sure yet if I'm ever going to reshoot that video because it's actually doing pretty good. Uh, it, if I was to go back and re-edit it, I'd make some changes and cut out some of the stuff. But still, it's a it's not a bad video. I talk about quite, I think I cover pretty much everything in there and it seems kind of pointless to reshoot it. So I'll go ahead and put that video here and down here on how you can make your own homemade herbal shampoo. What I'll be doing with this is the same I did last year and I'll be using fresh herbs instead of dried like I did in that video, but you can do it either way. I still gotta go out and pick some more calendula flowers. Uh, they always kind of, they, they wait until later in the day to open up. And so I've got my rose petals, I've got sage, I've got uh, viola flowers, I've got my nasturtiums, really good for helping uh, if you have hair loss, you know, if you're suffering some kind of hair loss. 
the nasturtium flowers are really good for that. And I also have thyme flowers and there's a little bit of lavender left in there. My lavender's done, but I did manage to go out there and find a few lavender flowers. So that's gonna go in there. And here is my, my dried herb mix. Um, I still need to add some sage to this, but this is going to be uh, my blend of herbs for specifically making shampoo out of dried herbs. So that's, again, that's one way you can do it. And I'll be using my homemade flaxseed oil soap. I really like this for washing my face with. And the hemp seed oil soap is another really good one for washing your face with and for using in your homemade shampoo. That's what I made my homemade shampoo out of last year was the hemp seed oil soap. And I loved it. It was my best, and that's what this is, my best batch of shampoo yet. I'm using the fresh herbs and the hemp seed oil. So this time I'm using the flaxseed oil soap, and I think I'm going to like that really good because both of those are excellent for your hair. And then over here you can see all my extracts and tinctures because I'll be shooting a video here maybe today or tomorrow on the difference between extracts and tinctures. I've talked about it here and there in some other videos, but I've never done a video just talking about the differences between the two. So be watching for that video to come out shortly after this one if you're interested in learning the difference between the two and what my favorite way is to make them. Well, I hope you enjoyed my this and that for this week. Thanks for watching, take care, and God bless.